So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us in this Zoom talk tonight, organized by Association of Engaged Buddhists. My name is Meredith. So if this is your first time joining us, just a brief introduction of uh, AED. AED is a nonprofit organization formed by a group of lay Buddhist practitioners and supported by an ordained Sangha as our spiritual director, who is Bhante Tijadamo. So we hope to help addressing the needs of the wider community with a skillful and practical application of the teachings of the Buddha through Dharma talks, meditation practice, meditation retreats and community services. And we have a beautiful retreat center at the Southern Highland of New South Wales called Veja Sala, where we hold our retreats, as you can see behind me. <laughs> so that is uh, our retreat center at Winjalo. So in fact, we will have retreats coming up very soon. Uh, we, we closed that for renovation for like more than a year. So finally, it's um, almost finished and we have exciting news to announce later. We will share with you much later then. So if you're looking for a community to practice and learn, we wish to be able to support you mentally and spiritually in a safe, caring and supportive environment. And if you haven't, please consider joining as our member and subscribe to our newsletter. So for information on how you can support us, please visit our website and I will post that link in the chat too. So tonight, we're very happy and grateful to have Bhante Akaliko back again to bring us the invaluable teaching of the Buddha. Tonight's topic is called Shaded by a Great Tree, Fate in the Buddha's Path. So Bande Akaliko will guide us in meditation and discussion about the nature of faith in Buddhist thought. Who is Bande Akaliko? If you haven't known, I'm sure everybody know Bande Akaliko. He, Bande Akaliko is from the Theravadian forest tradition. And when he first encountered Buddhism as a teenager and spent over 20 years practicing in different traditions before taking full ordination with Ajahn Brahm, as his preceptor of uh, Bodhinyana Monastery in 2016. And he currently resides in his, with his uh, long-term teacher, Bhante Sujato at Lokanta Vihara, which is called the Monastery at the End of the World in Sydney, Australia. So Bhante Akaliko is the founder of Rainbody, LGBTQIA+, Buddhist community, and a Buddhist chaplain at Western Sydney University. And he's also on the board of directors of the Buddhist Council of New South Wales. And Bhante Akaliko brings the Buddha's timeless wisdom to today's problem in practical ways, helping people find peace and happiness in their lives. So please put our palms together to welcome Venerable Akaliko. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much, Meredith. And thank you especially to you, Meredith, for all the good work that you do for the Association of Engaged Buddhists. I know that it's not easy putting together an event schedule and it takes a lot of commitment from you. So I just wanted to express my appreciation and I'm sure that everyone else on this call appreciates your help as well. And thank uh, to thank the Engaged Buddhists for welcoming me again to give a talk. I'll just begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land that I'm on and that we're all on today. And I'm in uh, Paramadigal country, Darug Nation land here in Parramatta, Harris Park, Sydney, Australia. So I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And uh, so today's talk is about faith. So I'm just looking at the, I'm looking at the participants and thinking, oh, this would be this will be interesting because I think some of you are quite new to Buddhism. Some of you have come to Buddhism from quite a different, uh, maybe, uh, maybe an interesting path towards this kind of spiritual practice. Some of you are uh, maybe Buddhist by birth. Perhaps you grew up in a Buddhist country or you knew that you were Buddhist from a young age. So there's sometimes when you mention Buddhism and uh, that it's a, a faith group or a religion, a lot of people kind of get up in arms and say, Buddhism isn't a religion and Buddhism doesn't have faith and things like this. So tonight I wanted to explore some of those things and I wanted to explore it from 
a fairly personal perspective, as well as looking at stuff that comes from the suttas, and also look at the cultural context of Buddhism. And, or maybe a better way to put it is the cultural context, plural of Buddhism. And to understand what faith means in different places in the tradition, different cultures, and what it means to us as individuals. And when I started to think about this talk, I was, I was um, thinking about my own journey into Buddhism. It took me a long time to even feel comfortable calling myself a Buddhist. And for me coming to Buddhism, I remember the first time I entered, I suppose what you might call a sacred space, a traditional space, a space where um, Buddhism was practiced in a way that I'd never encountered before. I'm just gonna start showing my screen. And so uh, I guess just to backtrack, yes, this is the, the, the title of the talk, Shaded by a Great Tree. This will make some sense in a little while. Um, but this first image I wanna share with you is, is just that kind of space that I was just describing. So I was a white boy from the suburbs, an atheist. I had never really encountered this kind of religious space before. So what we're looking at here is a bunch of people coming together to practice in a way that is an external um, manifestation of their internal faith. So they're practicing Buddhists. I mean, this, this is, is this what we mean when we talk about practicing Buddhists? I don't know. And what we're looking at is, I guess, a kind of ritual, a ceremony. It's an external manifestation of people's internal belief in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha. And so this is something that I found really confronting when I first started going to these sorts of venues, monasteries, um, uh, Buddhist centers, other countries. I came from a tradition where there was no Buddha image, where there was no candles or incense. Uh, there was no ceremonies as such. And when I encountered this kind of stuff, I was kind of a little bit freaked out actually. Cause I was like, what am I doing here? Is this, what I, is this what I signed up for? Is this what I believe in? But I think underneath all of that was this confusion, a uh, lack of cultural understanding, maybe even some culture shock. I didn't know what was going on. Not knowing what was going on made me uncomfortable. I couldn't understand the language. I didn't know how to bow correctly. I didn't know what was happening. Sometimes they were doing this. Sometimes they were doing that. People thrust some chanting sheets in front of me and I had no idea what it meant. And there's just these words and no meaning. And it was very confusing. So in a way, this external manifestation of other people's faith ended up making me feel a little bit less faithful. <laughs> it had the opposite effect because it was confusing, because it was culturally different. And it took me some time to grow into this practice. It took me some time to uncover the meanings, the purpose of these things. It took me some time to appreciate what these practices meant to the people who did them. And so this is something I learned and I continue to learn through my practice as a Buddhist, just how different people's expression of their spiritual practices and just how varied it is from place to place and culture to culture, person to person. And so I've learned to kind of suspend a little bit of my judgment and to try to understand what it means to have an individual faith, what it means to share that with a community and what it means for us as spiritual practitioners to touch base with that aspect of ourselves to develop our faith.
to want to increase it and make much of it as we go along the spiritual path. And so that's why at the beginning of uh, tonight's session, just as with many other beginnings of Buddhist talks, ceremonies, meditation retreats, we're going to start by using the traditional expression of faith, which is the chanting of the Namo Tassa and the going for refuge, along with the uh, recollections of the Triple Gem. So it's already quite a lot of information. And I'm going to share uh, my screen so that you can chant along. And I encourage you if, you, if this is something that you don't usually do, I encourage you to just give it a go. And you can just enjoy the sound of the chanting, or you can read the meaning of the words. And uh, you can just see what it means to have an external manifestation of something that's usually internal for us. I know for me, when I come to practice in this way, it's like coming home, touching base with, with a part of myself. It sets up a spiritual container, a sacred space for me that separates the rest of my life from this activity. And even though um, you know, I'm a monk, my, my, my whole life is pretty much spiritual and Buddhist, this is something I remember was very useful from my lay life that I left behind the world outside and I came down to sit and I did this ritual of chanting. In a second, I'm going to light some candles and incense. And it was a way of centering myself. These words, these chants, these acts of doing the lighting of candles and incense, bowing, these are useful because they establish us in the moment and they remind us of why we're on the spiritual path. So this manifestation of faith is like a reminder, it's like a centering, a, a kind of anchoring that we can use for our practice that helps contain our practice and give us a, a space where we feel like we're spiritual people. <laughs> and, and so when you look behind me here, you see there's already a, quite a lot of things going on. We have the image of the Buddha, it's called a Buddha Rupa. When we first moved in here, we didn't have one. And one of our friends, a, a nun in the Tibetan tradition, uh, she, Ayayeshe, actually, she insisted that we, we have one. And so she actually fundraised and bought us a Buddha Rupa. And so this is quite a common feature, of course. It's, a, it's the teacher, our teacher, the, the progenitor of Buddhism. So this is why we keep it on a higher uh, level here and why we uh, bow down to not to the Buddha as a, as a kind of god or um, anything like that, but bowing down to the qualities that the Buddha has. And I'll talk more about that later. And of course, there's already some candles burning. You can never have enough candles, as it turns out. And I was thinking about this today because it's this offering of light, which is what we call it. It's an offering of light. This is, you know, it goes way, way, way back. And humans have this fascination with fire and uh, it goes way, way back to fire worship, I guess, controlling fire, triumphing over nature. And it's also an offering of light, a shattering of the darkness. That's why candles are used. It's like a symbol for enlightenment. Um, we have Pante, Pante you, yeah. you might want to stop the share so that we can see a bigger screen of your... Ah, sure. Auto. Good idea. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, so here you can see in detail. Uh, and then there's a, a, a flower here on the shrine as well, which is a, um, a rose, which usually flowers represent uh, impermanence. It's kind of like this beautiful thing that represents the brevity of life. And here, this one actually is being enclosed in argon gas. And so it's actually trying to thwart the Buddha's teaching of impermanence. And so we have these things on the shrine. We have this direction 
for our practice. So usually we begin by bowing three times, bowing to the Buddha, bowing to the Dhamma, and bowing to the Sangha. And the Sangha here, of course, is the Arya Sangha, the noble Sangha, Sangha of enlightened beings. It doesn't mean the, the mundane, everyday, monastic Sangha like me. It means those enlightened beings who have realized the truth of the Dhamma, the truth of the Buddha's teachings for themselves. And so this is the way that we begin our practice by bowing three times as a mark of respect. And I remember it being really confronting for me the first time I bowed. It was something that was completely alien to me. I'd never done it as a youth. And I found it really difficult, really confronting. And it took me some time to feel okay about it. And of course, uh, no one's forced to do that here tonight if you don't want to. Some people will just do this and just make a kind of um, uh, a nod of the head. It's about a gesture of respect. And so this gesture of respect uh, shows a kind of inner um, faith, it shows a, a gesture of, of, this is something that I hold up and I hold dear. And this is important to me. And comparing myself to the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha, I feel okay now about lowering myself down. Buddha, such an amazing teacher, the Dharma is so profound, and the Sangha, they really learned how to practice well. And so there's some humility there, which I suppose is uh, encapsulated by that act of bowing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the bowing. I'm going to light some candles, I'm going to light some incense, and the incense representing, I think, according to some people, the, the, um, the things that we put out into the world, and in the same way that the smoke kind of billows through the world, so we can do that, and, um, and then we'll do some chanting. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen, so if you don't know the, the chant, we can, we can do it together. And so this, of course, all feeds into the theme of the topic. Um, and I just wanted to, to take us through those stages and to make, make, make sure that people understood what was going on. Because I know some of you are quite new to Buddhism. So when you go into these spiritual spaces, no one explains these things to you. And you feel like you don't belong or you feel like you're outside the group. You feel a, a bit inept and perhaps that it's difficult for you to connect. And those feelings, of course, separate us from our spiritual practice. And whether you want to do these things in your own time or not, uh, it's up to you. But just to give everyone a chance tonight to kind of uh, experience a little aspect of Buddhist culture. So I'm going to begin by bowing three times. Then I'm going to make the offering of light. And then light the incense. Thinking about things we put out into the world. So this is what we call a puja, a little ceremony. And the next thing we do is we, we chant. And usually we would chant in the direction of the Buddha. Uh, but because I've got to share this screen here, I'm going to uh, face towards the camera. And we usually chant with our hands, showing this gesture of respect called Anjali. And so we chant with our hands together like this. And if you want, you can read along. We'll do it in English and in Pali. It'll take a little bit longer, but the meaning 
is what's important here. And so we begin by reciting this opening homage to the Buddha three times. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. And the next thing we do is what's called the going for refuge. And so the going for refuge is a mark of faith in Buddhism. So this is a formula that's repeated over and over again throughout the suttas and used in many different Buddhist ceremonies as an expression of faith. Going to refuge is the quintessential way that people show their faith in the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so this is uh, something that happened all the way back in the Buddha's time and has been handed down to us uh, through countless generations of Buddhists. So we go to refuge three times. In Buddhism, everything happens in three times because of the triple gem, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Buddhang saranangachami. I go to the Buddha for refuge. Dhammang saranangachami. I go to the Dhamma for refuge. Sankang saranangachami. I go to the Sangha for refuge. Dutiyampi buddhang saranangachami. For a second time, I go to the Buddha for refuge. Dutiyampi dhammang saranangachami. For a second time, I go to the Dhamma for refuge. Dutiyampi sankang saranangachami. For a second time, I go to the Sangha for refuge. Tatiyampi buddhang saranangachami. For a third time, I go to the Buddha for refuge. Tatiyampi dhammang saranangachami. For a third time, I go to the Dhamma for refuge. Tatiyampi sankang saranangachami. For a third time, I go to the Sangha for refuge. So this is the going for refuge, the triple gem. And then the next thing that happens is the itipiso, which is the recollection of the Buddha. So we do a recollection of the Buddha, we do a recollection of the Dhamma, and we do a recollection of the Sangha. So these are the first of the three anusatis, three recollections. And the Buddha taught several types of anusati, several types of recollection. And if you're interested in learning more about those, I'll be teaching a retreat with the engaged Buddhists down at Vajrasala in April. It's a four day retreat, looking at the suttas in detail. I will examine these concepts uh, very carefully. Many books have been written, thousands of words have been written just on these few lines that we're about to read. And these are very profound concepts, very deep, very meaningful. And it's something that we do all the time as Buddhists. Some, some of you will know the words, but not know the meaning. The meaning is very important. Some of you will know the words and know the meaning and still not feel anything. 
doesn't bring anything up. It can, it can become something you do just by rote, just by ritual. Turn up, bow down three times, light some incense, light some candles, do a bit of chanting and got that out of the way now. Isn't that good? And so this isn't the way that we, we are supposed to, to use these um, words. We're actually meant to take them into our heart to allow them to inspire us, to allow them to bring a sense of awe and amazement to our practice, to lift us up, to take us away from the ordinary, the mundane world, to point us in the direction of the Dharma, to give expression to a really big spiritual tradition that we're a part of. And these words lay out the whole path. They're like the whole path in brief. And so these are really profound things that we're chanting here. They're not just something that we want to get out of the way. And so that's why the meaning is very important. I'm not going to go into detail for the meaning of all these things tonight, but I just wanted to point that out. That these are actually an opportunity for us. This is an opportunity for us to develop beautiful mind states. And these practices are, these are meditation subjects in their own right. The recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. These are recommended by the Buddha as recollections. And when we recollect these uh, beautiful concepts, our mind becomes very uh, profound. Joy springs up in our hearts. We get rushes of pity. We get beautiful bliss from thinking about these incredibly wonderful concepts and thinking about our relationship to these brings a lot of joy in our hearts. And these are used as a vehicle to move us towards samadhi. And so they're not just a ritual that we have to get out of the way. These are things that will uh, create the Dharma in our hearts, incline our mind to really skillful states and develop our meditation to samadhi. So this is pretty special and we shouldn't just rush through them, but we should use them as opportunities. And that's why we do these things at the beginning of our practice in order to inspire the mind. This is the whole point. We're not just doing it because we have to tick this box. There's a point to this ritual that we're doing. All of these things, bowing down to the Buddha, lighting the candles, lighting the incense, reciting these verses, all of these things are pointing us towards something. All these things are inclining our mind to the teachings of the Buddha. All of these things are inspiring us. And so this is why we do these things at the beginning of our practice. So the next part is chanting the recollections. So, um, We'll do it again, we'll do it in English and also in, in the Pali as well. So it'll take a little bit of time, but hey, that's why we're here to understand these things. Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho. That blessed one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha. Vija charana sampano sugato lo kavidu, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy knower of the world. Anutaro purisa dhamma sarati sata deva manu sanang buddho bhagavati. Supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. And then the recollection of the Dhamma. 
Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo. The teaching is well explained by the Buddha. Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko. Visible in this very life, immediately effective, inviting inspection. Opanaiko Pachatangweditapo be relevant so that sensible people can know it for themselves. And the recollection of the Sangha. Supatipano Bhagavato Sahawaka Sanko. The Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is practicing the way that's good. Ujjupatipano bhagavato sahawaka sanko. They're practicing straightforwardly. Nyaya patipano bhagavato sahawaka sanko. They're practicing methodically. Samiji patipano bhagavato sahawaka sanko. They're practicing properly. Yadi dan chata ripurisa yugani ata purisas ata purisa. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it. consists of the four pairs of the eight kinds of individuals. So I was actually reading it from the, um, I don't usually read it. You kind of know these things by heart. Esa bhagavato sahawaka sanko. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples. Ahuneyo pahuneyo dakineyo anjali karaniyo. They are worthy of offerings that are dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of a religious donation, worthy of greetings with hands joined. Anu tarang punya ketang lokasati. They are the supreme field of merit for the world. This is Bhante Sujato's translation, which has thrown me a little bit. But you can see from these, uh, these qualities that there's a lot going on. That's why I said this is the whole path in brief. We have the Buddha who appears in the world. We have the Dhamma, the teaching that he discovered himself through his own efforts. And then we have the Sangha, the people who have heard the teaching, understood it and become enlightened as well. And so this is the whole path. The path that we're aiming for is also to come out of suffering and to come out of suffering completely is to uh, become enlightened also. And so these are the, the, the three ways that we recollect the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And these are the three ways that we affirm our connection to the, the, the historical Buddha, his teachings, and the large Buddhist tradition of enlightened beings, people who uh, have attained the same realizations as the Buddha, over thousands of years. And so when we, we chant these things, we're, we're, we're connecting with that bigger tradition. And that's why it's a cultural expression. Of course, people practice in their own very idiosyncratic, very personal ways. And I think that's a really important thing. People have their own way of connecting to their spiritual practice. They have their own little rituals. They have their own special spot, their own way of sitting, their own way of reflecting. And these are really important. We don't want to feel like we're peer pressured into doing a certain form of expressing our faith externally. And when it comes to our inner expression of faith, the way that we um, connect, with that part of ourself, it should be individual. It should be personal. It should be something that matters to you. It should be something that brings about some emotion 
in your heart. Because faith generally is slightly irrational, slightly emotional expression of our understanding of something. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. What exactly does faith mean? And is this a good translation for the words that we find in the Pali? Is this meaning that we understand something that the Buddha meant by using this word faith? And so um, that's what, something we'll explore later, but we do need to do some meditation. And I thought what we should do is, is actually do one of the anusutis, one of the recollections. And the one that we're going to do tonight is the reflection of the Buddha. So usually when you do the recollection of the Buddha, you'll do uh, a recitation of those words that we just chanted. And hopefully some of those words or maybe one of those words will bring up something for you. But I'm, you know, we've just... We've, we've just been through them. There's a lot of words. And I wanted to create some space for you to explore your own practice. And so the recollection that we're going to do tonight is something that Bhante Sujato teaches. And this is kind of like a meeting of the Buddha. So we're not recollecting his qualities, but we're actually imagining seeing the Buddha ourselves. And so this is a very personal way that we can connect with the historical figure, and maybe express some gratitude for all the teachings that we've learned and think about how it's helped us in our lives. And imagine what it would be like if we could connect with the Buddha here and now. And so we're going to take a comfortable posture, sitting in a way that works for you, something that allows you to be comfortable. And so find that right spot for you. Find that comfortable position. Maybe take the shoulders up to the ears and draw them back down, opening up the chest and just let go. So these little rituals we've been doing, these chanting and lighting the candles, this has been setting up a sacred space, establishing a perimeter, creating a container around this practice. In fact, all those things are leading to this moment where we stop and sit. So we just allow ourselves to let go of the past. Not worry about the future. Instead, just feeling like we're here now, that we can be present. Alive to what's going on right here, right now. And for this short time, there's nothing else for you to do. There's nowhere you need to be to establish this container for our practice. And so we let go of those things from the world beyond from our daily lives and we create a little space for our spiritual practice.
So just settle into that space. The next few minutes, relaxing the body and releasing any tightness or tension. Decompressing the mind, allowing yourself to just rest in stillness. Become calm and peaceful. And so now that we're feeling a bit more peaceful and calm, we turn our mind to recollecting the Buddha. And so we imagine, imagine yourself two and a half thousand years ago. We're walking through a dark, cool forest. And we've heard that there is a great sage, a Buddha, residing in the forest. We're walking through the forest, thinking, well, oh, these are the teachings I've heard that this Buddha talks about. Maybe there's something you already know. Something that makes you curious makes you want to learn more, find out more about this man's teachings. And then in the distance, you see the Buddha sitting under a tree in meditation, so peaceful, so serene, that enigmatic smile on his face. Perhaps a feeling of calm. Sense of Hushed awe. Feeling of peace in the forest. How does it feel to be in the presence of an enlightened being? How does it feel to be in front? Buddha. And the Buddha arises from meditation and gives a Dharma talk. And so thinking, what is some Dhamma you know? What are some of the Buddha's words that you have heard? A teaching, meditation instructions, something that made sense to you. And 
imagine hearing these words from the Buddha himself. How wonderful that would be. How powerful. I'm thinking, what did this teaching mean to you? How did it affect your mind? How did it help you in your practice, in your life? maybe a little bit of gratitude arising in your heart. So thankful for these teachings, so profound, so rare, so precious. And how fortunate we are to have heard the Buddha's Dharma how fortunate we are that the Buddha decided to teach so that we too can have access to wisdom, access to a path that leads to the end of suffering. This gratitude is joyful. We smile. Thank you, dear Buddha. Thank you. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for helping me develop wisdom in my life. Thank you for showing me the path. enriching my life, broadening my experiences. Maybe you see a special feeling arising Gratitude, that joy, connected with what is wholesome and beautiful. Connected with goodness. Connected with happiness. fortunate we are. The Buddha discovered the path to eradicate suffering. How wonderful it is. We have access to this Dhamma. 
how amazing so many people have realized the Dhamma for themselves. Thinking of those teachings of the Buddha that we know, is there something that made sense to you? Something that felt right, that you understood, that helped you? Seeing the truth of something for yourself allows for faith to arise, a confidence in the teacher, a conviction in the Dharma, a faith that liberation is possible. Maybe there's a certainty in your heart, a solidity. Yes, this is true. This path is right. You have confidence, conviction. You have some faith in the Buddha, in the Dharma, in the Sangha. And now it's time to leave the Buddha, let him get back to his meditation. And so we pay our respects. Humbled by the Buddha's teaching, by the Buddha's attainments, such beautiful qualities, such perfect conduct. We pay our respects and walk away back to the forest, changed, and coming back now to here and this place, this time. Back to your cushion or seat, and allowing those special feelings to fade away, allowing yourself to relax your awareness and arise in this recollection, this meditation. When you're ready, gently opening the eyes. And so this is a very personal and simple way that we can recollect the Buddha. So amazing when I think about all the wonderful qualities that the Buddha had, all the profound teachings and, and how much I take for granted. <laughs> and, and just what an incredible achievement it was, not only to attain liberation, but to share the Dharma. And we're so lucky that it's been passed down, that we can access it today, it really is something that we should take the time to reflect upon.
and allow to connect with in our hearts. So, are you feeling okay? Was that okay for you? Is it, maybe if you're expecting some really hardcore insight meditation, um, perhaps you'd be disappointed, but maybe it softened up your heart a little bit. And I want to keep going because I'm already running out of time. And so this concept of this great trees, it's not only about uh, the Buddha uh, sitting under a tree, but this is something uh, that the Buddha described as a way that we can understand faith. And so here we have a picture of a seed and it's growing. The Buddha said, faith is the seed. Austerity is the rain. So austerity here is tapas. Tapas is like your meditation practice, your practice of renunciation, of sense restraint. This is tapas or austerity. You might think of it just as practice. Faith is like a seed. Austerity is the rain. And wisdom is the yoke and plow. So faith is a seed. It's the beginning of something. It's something that contains uh, growth that can occur. The rain is the meditation practice that helps nourish that seed of faith. And that wisdom, uh, this is like the, what we harvest. And it all comes from this tiny little seed. And so for many of us, there was a little seed that took us towards the Dharma, a little bit of conviction. We heard something, we read something. Maybe we saw a statue of the Buddha and it inspired us. This was the seed, this was the beginnings of our faith. And then that small seed can become a giant tree. And the Buddha says, suppose there was a great bunyan tree at a crossroads. It would become a refuge for birds from all around. In the same way, a faithful person becomes a refuge for many people, for monks, for nuns, for lay women and lay men. And so this idea of, of our faith being a refuge is very beautiful. In the same way that a, a, a great tree shades and provides shelter. I experience this when, when I encounter people of faith as a monk, you know, we go towards people of faith, people of faith are the people who look after us, they have a belief, they have a, a sense of, of conviction that the, the monks and nuns are doing something important. And they, these people of faith, they are like great trees, they shelter us, they provide accommodation, they feed us, they give us clothes, you know, they, I really do feel protected by people of faith. And even someone like Meredith tonight, who has organized all of these talks and all the team at the Engaged Buddhists, these are people of faith, people who have conviction that this is an important thing. And they provide this tree of Dharma teachings for us online. You know, we have this space where we can come and sit together and to experience something that is very beautiful. So this is like a refuge for us. Coming together as a group is very beautiful. This is a refuge for our spiritual practice. So these images of the seed, something that starts small and grows big, and that big tree that shelters us, this is something very beautiful that the Buddha says has to do with faith. And so this is, again, that kind of external version of faith. And I mentioned before at the beginning of the talk that sometimes this can be a bit confusing or a bit um, uh, culturally different. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to acknowledge all the different ways that all the different traditions practice uh, their faith, that they manifest it. Uh, so for in the West, like the most common way, we go to 
a meditation center or a retreat center. We come together as a group, we listen to a Dharma talk. But there's many other different ways of practicing. There's many other different expressions of faith. And I think it's very important for us to be aware that in the West, there is also a culture. I go to a lot of uh, meditation groups and they don't have these external expressions of faith. They don't have candles and incense, they don't bow down, but there is still a culture there. And sometimes people don't see it because they think of it as normal. But I guess if you're coming from like Thailand or Laos, going to a space like that, you have this kind of jarring culture, culture shock in the same way that I had culture shock going to Thailand and Laos. And so I just want to acknowledge that there's different ways that faith is expressed. And that's wonderful. That's good. But it isn't all equal. And we want to understand what faith is not. And so I thought it's good to do some myth busting at the beginning here. So when we express our faith, we are not praying to the Buddha. The Buddha is not a, a god. He's not an omnipotent figure who can grant us wishes or um, cure us or protect us. We're not praying for favours from the Buddha. We're not asking for mercy or for anything like that. It's not mere devotion. Faith isn't just about these external things. Faith isn't just about lighting a candle. It's much more deeper, much more meaningful than that. So we have to be careful that we don't lapse into a mere ritualistic form of faith. It's not going to help us develop as people on the spiritual path. So faith in Buddhism isn't really mystical or magical or superstitious. By that, I don't mean that there's some sort of, we don't access the Buddha um, through our practice of faith. He doesn't talk to us or um, tell us what to do. It's not like an oracle. Uh, we don't have to perform rituals in certain ways to please the Buddha. This isn't how we practice. Maybe some Buddhist traditions have these aspects to them. But in early Buddhism, the path that I practiced, we don't have these kind of superstitious forms. And our faith is not exchanged for material gain. We don't go to refuge for the Buddha hoping to get a pay rise or a new job. And most importantly, in Buddhism, faith is not blind. It's never asked of us that we should not question. It's never asked of us that we shouldn't have doubts or want to understand things better. We want to have a reasoned faith, something that makes sense to us. And for me, sometimes I see the way Buddhism is practiced in different places, and there is a little bit of a, a shock. You know, here we have on the left uh, some people uh, expressing devotion and making meritorious actions by putting gold on an image of the Buddha. So they're expressing generosity, they're, they're, they're showing their devotion. But I'm not sure why this is important or how this benefits them. And on the right, we have people offering flowers and incense and praying to the Buddha. And it's quite common in a lot of cultures when you do this to ask for a special favor, like maybe to help with your um, a job application or to help someone get better or to dedicate the merit of your offering to a deceased loved one or something like that. And I found these, um, these requests on a Buddhist website where people were praying for something. And so this is a kind of faith that I don't think is very useful. And so it says, um, I can't read it all because the screen is covered up here. Uh, pray for a financial miracle. Is that what it says? Yeah, How pray wonderful. for yeah, pray for a financial miracle for me and please pray for my right knee. So financial miracle, don't we all want a financial miracle? <laughs> and of course, pray for my right knee. My right knee is bad as well. And so maybe 
if I just bow down to the Buddha and ask, maybe the Buddha will help? Is that how it works? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's how it works. What about praying for my success in financial matters? These are all requests people, people were praying for these on this Buddhist website. It's a bit, bit of a theme emerging. Good health and even more success in business. And then this rather random one, this person says, Buddha is spiritual and lives inside us. He is almighty. Prayers will be answered. Be thankful for this beautiful life. Thank God for this <laughs> wonderful creation. It was starting to get a little bit weird, right? <laughs> and so Meredith, I can hear you still talking there. <laughs> And yeah, so things suddenly get a bit weird. What does all this mean? How are people thinking that this is the, the way to express faith? Is this, is this the way that we practice Buddhism? And so for a lot of people, especially coming from the West, this is really confusing to see people asking for things in exchange or wanting to get something, thinking that the Buddha can somehow provide these things to us. And of course, you know, the Buddha never said that uh, having material success is, uh, is what we want. He said, get rid of money, you know, get rid of your money, give it away, be generous, be, be uh, kind to others. Don't accumulate it for the sake of um, having money. You know, he renounced money. He renounced receiving gold. He said that our bodies are falling apart, that things change. You, know, you can't cure a hurt knee by requesting it from the Buddha. And so it's important when we, we think about the way we practice, just to watch out for how these things might start to creep into our practice uh, and how they might not lead us towards the path that the Buddha described, uh, but away from what is important for us to realize. And this image here is an image I found of, I guess, what you call a type of faith healing. So this is a kind of danger that we might fall into if we believe that the Buddha is going to cure our ills or help us in financial matters. This is an image of a temple in Thailand where people get into a coffin. These are shared coffins. And the monks come along and they drape the sheet over them and it cures them of their bad luck. And so they're kind of reborn. So this of course is a kind of ritual, kind of superstitious thinking. And this is not what the Buddha taught. And this is not what we mean by faith. We're not going to heal our ills or heal our woes with this kind of faith. So what is faith in early Buddhism? Faith is a confidence, a conviction. And these are the words I use in the meditation. These are inspired. Our confidence is inspired. Our conviction is inspired by qualities, by knowledge. And most importantly, our faith is inspired. Our conviction rests upon our experiential understanding. We've seen it for ourselves. We understand it, we know it for ourselves. Not because someone told us, not because we read it in a book, but because we experience it for ourselves. And that's why that personal expression of faith is very, very important. Those things that we know, those things that we've heard, those things that make sense to us, this is what we place our conviction on, our confidence in. It can also be devotional. It can be emotional. It can feel inspired and joyful. It should. These are such beautiful things. They should lift our mind. We should feel wonderful to have this conviction in our heart. We're not lost. We have a path. We know where we're going. And it can also be a very reassuring thing. It can help us to feel centered. And there is a kind of protection 
that comes from having conviction, from having confidence. And we see this also in the suttas where the Buddha would encourage people who are alone in the forest to practice a recollection of the Buddha. And it wasn't, I don't think, a kind of superstitious thing or a, that the Buddha was magically protecting, but it was more that these qualities create peace and calm in our minds. We become serene. There's another word uh, which I'll get to in a second, pasada. Pasada, which means like a, a kind of brightness, a clarity, but it's also like this kind of um, serene confidence that we can develop as a kind of faith. And so there are quite a few different types of faith. So the one that we talk about most of the time when we talk about faith is sadha. So sadha is this sense of conviction, confidence. It's also one of the um, five spiritual powers, the five spiritual faculties. It's used in a lot of different ways, but it's also used in this very plain form of having confidence in something that we've heard, or having confidence in a teacher. And there's that other word, pasada, this kind of clarity and brightness that we get from faith. Uh, feels right, it feels good, we're, we're, we're assured we feel like we've got the right thing, we've got the goods. And then there's avecha pasada, which is that experiential confidence. It's also known as a kind of perfected faith, something which is perfected because it's been understood thoroughly. This is one of the, the factors of a, a stream enterer. They have this, this faith that's very deep, and profound because people who have gotten to the point of stream entry have seen the Dhamma for themselves. So they have this very deep confidence that based on experience. Another word that is often used when talking about faith is akampia, which means unshakable, immovable, something that's really firm and solid. And that's something I try to draw your attention to through the meditation, that feeling of knowing something. And achala, which means unwavering, unshakable. So these last three qualities, these, these are qualities of faith that are associated with people who have reached a very high point of the path, one of the enlightenment stages. So it's important for us, perhaps at the beginning of our path, we don't have that sense of confidence, of deep, unshakable faith in the Buddha and his teachings. We haven't realized anything that makes us one of the Arya Sangha. We just got a little bit of faith, a little bit of knowledge. We've just got a little bit of conviction in these things. Faith is a spectrum. So there's some people who have a little bit of faith, and there's some people who have a lot of faith. At the beginning of the path, we'll just have a tiny bit of faith. At the end of the path, we have a supreme amount of faith because we've seen it for ourselves. We don't need to rely upon faith. We have a real conviction. And faith is something that develops gradually. It's not something that we can force. It's not something that we can push. It's something that happens over time. And it happens because we get new information and it helps us to deepen that faith. And so that's what I mean when I say that this quality of faith changes over time. It doesn't stay the same. The faith that I had going to a monastery for the first time, it's very different to the kind of faith I have now as a practitioner. And as mentioned before, those high stages of faith, they're associated with seeing the truth for yourself. And so you can imagine if you've got that deep kind of faith that comes from seeing the noble truth for yourself, 
how different your mind would be, how different your belief in the Buddha's teachings would be. So as I said before, we have this traditional expression of, of Buddhist faith, which is taking refuge. Sometimes it's uh, externally, like lighting the candles and bowing down and chanting. Sometimes it's internally, you know, oh, I have this belief in the Buddha and his teachings. It can, come across, it can come upon us sometimes in our meditation practice or when we read a sutta or we have a memory of a teaching and it's like, oh, it's so profound, so meaningful, so fortunate to have. And so we have this intellectual confidence. Most of us will have a smidgen of intellectual confidence. And the way we gain more faith is by seeing the results in our practice. When we see the results, we gain more conviction. Ah, the Buddha was right. He wasn't just joking me around. These things are true. Ah, a little bit more faith arises. I'm just going to skip through uh, that or move to this screen which is uh, the development of faith in the suttas. So this is something that I mentioned during the meditation, the way these things happen in the suttas is probably similar to the way that we encounter the Buddhist teachings in our own lives. So it starts by seeing or hearing about someone or something, a teacher or their teaching. We get inspired enough to go and see them we hear this reputation, we've heard about their teachings. And so we approach them and we listen to the Dhamma. So we see here that faith kind of comes before we meet a teacher. Faith is something that we need to have as, a, as that tiny little seed within ourselves. And for me, maybe that faith was something that I had when I, I, I kind of I would see images of the Buddha when I was a young person. I would see a Buddhist monk or nun. And I had this kind of like, oh, there's a spiritual life out there in the world. Something that I'm interested in. This is, this is a kind of faith that there's a curiosity that wants to learn more. There's something in me that resonates with that. So it's a kind of faith, it's like that seed. It's something that allows us to, to go and seek out more. And so we approach the teaching, teacher, we listen, and then we don't just take it blindly, but we scrutinize these teachings. We interrogate them, we synthesize them, we, we try to make them meaningful for us. We want to understand them for ourselves. It's so important that these teachings matter to us as a person, as an individual. So we don't just accept things at face value, we interrogate them. This is how we develop faith, by developing that confidence, by seeing, ah, these things are correct, ah, these things are right, ah, these things are true and profound. This allows for more faith to come into our hearts. And then we put those teachings into practice. We actually live them. We hear the Buddha say, killing is bad, don't kill. And then we practice non-killing and we see how our mind feels when we don't kill. We understand, oh, when I do kill, then my mind feels like this. So we start to see how the Buddha outlined a, a spiritual path that helps us. So we can gain confidence in the teachings in this way, scrutinizing, putting the teachings into practice and seeing the results. When I meditate, I feel calm and peaceful. My mind becomes serene. I get stillness. Ah, the Buddha's teachings were right. We know for ourselves. We see it for ourselves. And this is what's important. This is why I... I teach in Bhante Sajjata and other teachers also teach a process of reviewing after meditation. But reviewing is something that we can do uh, anytime in our spiritual practice. It doesn't have to be just after meditation. But to see, these are the teachings. This is how I practice. These are the results I get. So that's an important 
process that we should be aware of. We need to see in ourselves some momentum, some progress on the spiritual path. We need to look. We need to become reflective practitioners, reflective spiritual practitioners. We don't want to just turn up, bow down three times, light some incense, do a bit of meditation, and go, and not even allow for these experiences to impact us. We don't want to read the suttas and just skim, turn the pages, and not allow it to impact our heart. We need to become reflective about our spiritual practice. We need to take the time to uh, get to know how these things are affecting our mind. And then, of course, the ultimate way that we can have confidence is to go all the way. And this will give us true confidence in the spiritual path. So this is how it happens in the suttas. We see this in many, many different suttas. Someone has heard about the Buddha. They go to see him. They hear a teaching. Their mind becomes inspired. They gain conviction, thinking, oh, yes, that teaching was pretty good. In fact, I think it's true. And they develop faith and confidence in the teacher. They develop faith in the Buddhist path. So, I, you know, I've got this huge presentation planned. I don't know what I was thinking that, that I'll be able to get through it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. And maybe sometime we can do a part two. But I think these are the, the most important aspects for us that we're spiritual practitioners, we belong to a culture, that we have a personal expression of faith. We also have this external expression of faith, which is really important too. And both of these things uh, can benefit us as practitioners. Um, sometimes the external expression of faith can be really important to some people, uh, but they might neglect the internal manifestation of that confidence in the Buddha's teachings. Or well, sometimes we might have a lot of that inside of us and we might not pay much attention to that external expression of faith. It doesn't mean so much to us. Or we could have a combination of these things. Or at certain times, some practices might be really important to us and other things might not be. And so tonight's teaching has been about maybe drawing attention to some of the cultural expressions of Buddhism and giving some tips on how we can incorporate those in order to generate that, that inner, that personal understanding of faith arising, that expression of faith blossoming in our hearts and being okay <laughs> to allow for that to happen. It's a kind of opening up, a kind of releasing, to have this conviction which allows the mind of, uh, allows the mind to become confident, stable and steady, to become strong in your spiritual practice. Having this kind of faith is going to mean that you're going to keep going on the path. When we have um, those crises of faith or we lose interest or we become neglectful of our spiritual practice, this is when our faith is starting to wane. And our faith starts to wane when we don't have this sense of um, confidence that comes from seeing the changes that our spiritual practice has made in our life. When I look back at my own life, it's easy for me to forget just how much I've changed, just how important my spiritual practice has been, just how much faith I've accumulated in the Buddha's teachings because it's so incremental. And so sometimes when we, uh, you know, we've been on the spiritual path some time, it can be very easy to forget the causes that brought us to our current spiritual condition. We forget the things that we did, the things that we learned, 
the things that mattered to us at the beginning of the path, the things that propelled us to where they are now, it can become easy to forget that. And so we might neglect putting those causes in for our future benefit, for our future development. And so that's why sometimes thinking about faith, thinking about what brings conviction into your spiritual practice, thinking of how to incorporate it more into your spiritual practice is useful because uh, our tools can become blunt. We need to reaffirm our connection to our spiritual practice constantly. And that's why we have these rituals. That's why we have these ceremonies. It's why we do this chanting. But we need to make sure that we're not doing it in a ritualistic way, merely going through the motions, but using these as opportunities to deepen the practice in our hearts so that we have that sense of purpose, have that sense of um, confidence where we're developing our good qualities are increasing, our bad qualities are decreasing, we're purifying our mind. And when we see this, then we know we're moving in the right direction, we can develop more and more faith in the spiritual path, and with any luck, we'll get to the end of the spiritual path and attain liberation. And this is what the Buddha said is possible if we follow his teachings. And this is why that confidence in the Buddha's teaching leads to or confidence in the Buddha, leads to confidence in the Dhamma, and leads to the confidence that there are enlightened beings, that this is possible. And so have some faith. It's possible for the Buddha, possible for other beings, and maybe it's possible for us. The Buddha had faith in us, and that's why he taught the Dhamma. So this is a short talk about faith, much more to be said, and I hope that it was of some use to you, and I wish you the very best for your practice. Thank you, Bhante. Um, as you all know, Bhante always over-delivered, <laughs> so he's got you know, with so much content, leaving no time for questions, but never mind, you all still have the opportunity because we have a retreat coming. You have the whole four days that you can ask all the questions, can discuss all your practice. Before I go to that, can I ask everyone to, because when we have talk, every Thursday we have talk, um, and then we, uh, when we have events, I'll normally put on our websites and um, Facebook and some other platform. So I'll be I'll appreciate that if um, you know you can just let me know how do you know about us so that I know that you know where can I put up this event so that we can benefit more people. So either you're from um, the uh, AB Facebook AB website, uh, Rainbowdy or what's on Eventbrite and other things, uh, just put in the chat that you know to let me know where how do you find out about us. So. Um, just now we talk about the retreat. You can see behind me. So this is the uh, Vejasala, our retreat center. Vejasala means the place of healing. So you see that little kuti, that's the um, little kuti. Uh, it's one of our um, accommodations. So we have a main building and then we have a few kutis around um, the, uh, the landscape of the, um, uh, our uh, retreat center. So, you know, like two years ago, because of fire, some of the kuti has been burned down, some cottage, one cottage is burned down. And then we have to make a big renovation on our main building to make it more uh, fire uh, proof or fire regulation, you know, um, um, uh, approved by the, the, um, the council. So there's a lot of things been done. So we actually just, finished the renovation, we just got our certificates and we are ready to open up for retreat. And so our first um, formal retreat will be uh, Bante Akaliko's retreat called the uh, Contemplation as Meditation. So it will be during the um, Easter weekend from 15 to 18. 
the um, registration will be open only in early March because of some technicality, because as you say that we have just got the approval and some other bit, uh, bits and pieces that we need to um, finalize before we can officially open up the um, uh, registration. So just watch out for our Facebook and uh, our um, uh, website. Uh, we will notify you as you know when the registration is open. It will be at the 7th of March. It's always the same link, same time, same, same day. So we welcome you all uh, to join us on our Thursday talk. And that's it. <laughs> so it's 9.06. <laughs> we passed uh, our time. But uh, thank you all for staying with us. And uh, thank you, Bante. Just put our poem together. And just um, thank Bante Akaliko for this beautiful talk and um, meditation. It's really, really very nourishing for me, the meditation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And uh, good night, everyone. <laughs> good night, everyone. Mm -hmm. Take care. Stay safe. Be well. Thank you, everyone.